Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Welcome to Liberty Me You. We're here tonight for an author's forum with uh, Pete Earle uh, on his book, A Century of Anarchy. Uh, Pete is an economist and financial markets professional. He's spent uh, nearly two decades trading and studying global equity, derivative commodity and currency markets, as well as offbeat and esoteric markets when opportunities have allowed. And he's published numerous articles on economic history, spontaneous order, and liberty. And uh, his book that we're going to be discussing tonight is about a little area in uh, Belgium, I believe, that uh, accidentally ended up without a government for about 100 years. So I, I think it's going to be fascinating. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Pete. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, my name is Pete Earle, and uh, my book is called A Century of Anarchy, Neutral Moore's Net Through the Revisionist Lens. And in it, I discuss the brief and little-known history of Neutral Moorsnet, which was a, one of many and probably the last of what were called the shreds and patches of old Europe. Um, they were tens, maybe even hundreds, of small and independent communities on mountaintops and in valleys for hundreds of years uh, that operated out of sight and uninfluenced by the monarchies and later the democracies, which dominated the capitals of the Western world. Um, Neutral Moore's Net is, uh, as I said, is probably the last one, um, but uh, I mentioned a few of the others in the book in one of the footnotes. So, um, Neutral Moore's Net was, um, uh, it was a space of land and obscure territory um, through which almost a hundred years it had virtually no active or formal government. Um, uh, and some would say despite that, and I would say because of that, uh, it boomed both economically and socially uh, until the uh, conflagration that we know as World War I crushed it into the historical record. Uh, there's very little written about it. Uh, my book is really the first thing, it's only about 30 pages, but it's the first thing, first writing and research dedicated to it since uh, the last book written about it uh, was uh, published in 1882. And uh, most of the information I called together came from old newspaper articles, magazines, sometimes book references that were about 100 or 150 years old, and some of which I had to translate from French or German. Uh, anyway, so let's see here. So uh, after the um, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, um, like the end, like at the end of most wars, there was a splitting up of territories under the Congress of Vienna. And uh, one area that saw some change was the border between Prussia, pre-German Empire, Prussia, when it was its own state, the Netherlands, and eventually Belgium. And there's a small valley there um, in which there's a zinc mine. And the zinc mine was incredibly valuable because there were a lot of industrial and military applications for zinc. Um, so there was a mining settlement there uh, with a couple of hundred workers, and it roughly measured about a mile, mile and a half square. A, a, again, roughly maybe three and a half to four kilometers square. And it's shaped like a triangle. And all of the uh, sides, uh, all of the victors wanted the zinc, uh, but nobody wanted to leave it in anyone else's hands. So what they decided to do was set up what's called a condominium. And in the political sense, a condominium is a neutral territory that is overseen by a number of governments. So in this case, uh, nobody would exercise, everybody would exercise control essentially, uh, but no troops would be allowed in. And um, the uh, the residents would be considered sort of a nebulous sort of uh, stateless people, um, and there would be a board of various members, uh, various uh, political figures from the um, uh, uh, from the various countries that would oversee it. Um, so two quick points here about this condominium of Moorsnet, of neutral Moorsnet. First, it was incredibly isolated. There's an anecdote I found about a traveler who tried. This is all, most of this is in the book. Uh, there's an anecdote about a traveler who tries to reach it, and eventually even the people who run the train lines say, we have no idea where you're headed. We don't know where this place is. And also, uh, from the beginning, there was a mayor, and there was a single police officer who they jokingly called the Minister of War. And um, the, the committee tasked to oversee Moorsnet seemed to do nothing at all. Um, it seems like where there was supposed to be a number of governments oversee it, everybody was constantly, each side was constantly hoping that the other was watching. So essentially the entire, the, the, the entire body of, of authority in this um, small territory was a mayor and a burgermeister. And one of the anecdotes I read said that, uh, another one of the things I, that I found in an old article was that they said that if you wanted to find the mayor and the cop, 
or the officer who was in charge there, they were always reliably drinking beer and playing billiards. So they had very little to do with what was actually happening. Um, so again, while condominiums suggest multiple states bearing down on territory, in this case, out of sight seemed to be out of mind. Because slowly but surely, um, starting in around 1816, um, the zone and its residents of Moorsnet took on its own culture and character. The taxes were practically negligible. Uh, there were no border crossings, and um, over time, people outside of the miners began to gravitate there for two reasons. First, because there was a lack of, of an authoritative presence, and second, because if you were in the neutral territory of Morsnet, you couldn't get drafted. So a lot of people went there from, from, from Prussia, from Belgium, uh, and so on. Uh, from, a, from the initial population of about 250 miners and their families, by the time of the American Civil War, the population was numbering about 2,000. And there was everything from uh, entrepreneurs starting farms, bars. Um, there was a big uh, uh, brandy bootlegging operation because there were taxes and restrictions on the types of uh, liquor that could be brewed in both um, the Netherlands and uh, Belgium and uh, Prussia. So people would brew their uh, this particular blend in Moorsnet and then smuggle it out. And um, it, even actually, this jumps ahead in the story, but at one point in the early 20th century, a couple of casinos, which would, had been shut down in Prussia, briefly set up in Moorsnet. But uh, you can't really tell the story of neutral Moorsnet without mentioning one particular uh, personality, and that's Dr. Wilhelm Molly. He was a physician who uh, arrived in Kelmis. Uh, Kelmis, by the way, is the, uh, is the town. Uh, it winds, I mean, if you think of neutral Moorsnet as a, as a territory of uh, you know, a stateless state, Kelmis would be considered the, uh, the capital, but it's really just the town uh, next to the mine. And anyway, um, uh, Wilhelm Molly arrived from Germany to become the, uh, the doctor of the, um, of the mine, uh, to treat the miners and their families. And um, like many physicians of his day, uh, he wasn't just a doctor, but he was an intellectual. He had a lot of various interests. And one of the things we find about, uh, about uh, Dr. Molly that factors prominently into the history of uh, Moore's Net is his fascination with Esperanto. Uh, most of you probably know, but Esperanto is a language that was invented in the late 1880s by a fellow by the name of L.L. L. Zamenhof, a um, Polish guy, another doctor, um, and he created this language because he had this theory that languages are used by nations and they result in people becoming uh, uh, adversarial and they create uh, divisions where there shouldn't be any. So essentially, uh, by creating this stateless language, Zamenhof hoped to, 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 to promote a more nationless and sort of stateless world by mixing romantic and Slavic languages. And so, so uh, Wilhelm Molly, the doctor um, at the mine at Neutral Moorsnet, was, was infatuated with this. And he had a correspondence with some of the major Esperantists in the world. And he was a, a proponent of both the philosophies and the language. So um, by, by about... 1900, um, the zinc mine, sometime in the early 1900s, the zinc mine stopped producing. But Mordnet is now littered with breweries and restaurants and other business establishments. It was flourishing. And so the people began to think, you know, there, were, there should certainly be life after uh, neutral Mordnet, the, uh, the sort of uh, neutral mining colony. Um, and so um, it was about that time where Prussia began to step up the pressure against neutral Moorsnet. Uh, Prussia became part of the larger German Empire in the 1870s, I believe. And they began harassing uh, the Moorsnetians, uh, trying to get them to want to be absorbed into the greater German Empire. Um, so among other things, they made threats. A few times they cut electrical and telephone lines into Moorsnet. Uh, they tried to rig the Board of Overseers, which wasn't really overseeing anyway, against the inclusion of officials who wanted to leave Moorsnet neutral and unfettered, that sort of thing. And so amid this, in about 1908, uh, uh, Wilhelm Molly and a group of other Moorsnetians who had been, again, corresponding for years with other Esperantists and embracing the philosophies, announced that Moorsnet would thereafter be known as Amicagio. They were going to, 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 to uh, create a whole new territory under a different philosophy, under a different name. And Amicagio is the Esperantist, Esperanto word for a place of friendship. And so in, uh, there was a few news, uh, newspaper articles. Uh, there was a ceremony. There were reporters there. Um, there was no, of course, there was no diplomatic recognition. I don't think they saw it. Uh, but um, they stated as their long-term plan to form a sort of a neutral global hub for trade 
and a center for art and theater from around the world. And so that's what happened essentially. And if you go to um, Kelmus today, uh, there are still some buildings which have the, which have the large green star of uh, Esperanto uh, painted on there, which essentially designated places where you could speak Esperanto and uh, all that sort of thing. So now we're uh, at the eve of the outbreak of World War One. By this time, there were 5,000 people living in Moisnet, and if you can get your brain around that, you know that's a small triangle of land, uh, you know about a mile, mile and a half square. There's 5,000 people there now from the original 250, and um, um, only several hundred by that point were related to the original miners. And um, one, not only were there, there those few Moresnetians who you know had descended from the original miners a hundred years before, but there are Germans, now there's Belgians and Dutch. There were also found that there were Italians living there, there were some French people, some Russians, and really interestingly, I found uh, one anecdote that said that there was an American there and actually a Chinese person, which is uh, quite fascinating if you consider the context of time and place. And um, it said that there were between 60 and 70 bars and restaurants on the main street of Kelmus alone. And uh, at one point, they actually minted their own coins, which in the, uh, uh, in the coin collecting community are extremely rare. I've only seen uh, a record of one going up for auction. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clear how, how, um, how independently uh, they, uh, they developed and how they really kind of struck out on their own with no one kind of uh, overlooking them. Um, anyway, so the beginning of the end came in the morning of August 1st, 1914, when German troops crossed into Moorsnet. They, they were stone border markers with numbers on them. There, some of them are still there in, uh, in around uh, Kelmus in, in Belgium. Some of them are still um, standing there in the fields and stuff. But um, apparently at least two Moorsnetians uh, got their rifles and fired on the advancing troops, and they were caught and executed. And the Germans, when they took over um, neutral Moorsnet, they immediately separated people by their national background, which was difficult because there were Belgians living with Germans, and there were, you know, French living with uh, with other Moorsnetians and, and such. And so suddenly you have this proper, prosperous uh, community, this tiny community, well, tiny space with a lot of people. And the Germans refused to send aid because it might get to the Belgians, and the Belgians refused to send aid because it might be eaten by the, uh, by the Germans. And so in a very short amount of time, you had a horrific situation where there was almost starvation going on. And, um, and a lot of the businesses failed, and uh, eventually aid was sent. But, um, but uh, there, were, there were lots of appeals as the war drew to a close to let uh, uh, neutral Moors that retain its independent status. Um, uh, it, was, it was, again, using that reference, it was considered one of those sort of... Um, valuable shreds and patches of old Europe. And um, they went unheard, and uh, eventually, uh, with uh, just a few words, with the line, uh, Germany recognizes the full sovereignty of Belgium over the contested territory of Moorsnet, that 100 years was, was gone. Uh, that line was in the Treaty of Versailles, and um, that was the end. And uh, there's there's precious little that we uh, that we know about it. There's a lot that I don't know. So if you ask questions and I say I don't know, I'm not channeling the uh, the the, uh, the beleaguered congressman that I actually don't know. Uh, and uh, it's it's fascinating. It's uh, it, it reminds me of uh, a little bit if you know anything about micronations, about maybe the uh, Principality of Hutt River in Australia, that sort of thing. It's a fascinating episode, and I wish there was more written about it. But uh, I'm glad that uh, I had the opportunity to study it and capture as much as I could in, uh, in my little book. So that's, uh, that's, that's the whole of my spiel. Um, questions or comments? Anybody? Uh, thank you, Pete. That's fascinating. Uh, would, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in text in the questions tab uh, to the right of the chat tab. Or if you'd like to come on video and ask, you can click video chatting up above the, the chat window and then uh, click start your webcam and I'll be able to bring you on screen. Uh, I guess I will uh, get us started. Uh, did the the citizens of Moorsnet, did they have you know political affiliations? Did they think of themselves as you know uh, classically liberal or is, is there any kind of information on that? 
There's no evidence of that, uh, but they certainly viewed themselves as Morsnetians and not as, uh, you know, sort of a uh, an opportune territory overseen by, uh, uh, and, you know, a territory of opportunity, uh, you know, being used by uh, Belgium and uh, and uh, Prussia and, and the Netherlands for economic uh, uh, gain. Um, we don't know much about their political affiliation, however. If we, you know, I think we can speculate that if they embraced, if, if most of them embraced the, uh, the Esperanto philosophy um, the way they seem to have, so much so that they essentially wanted that to be the guiding philosophy of their new territory, you know, we know that they had classical liberal uh, aspirations, or at least some, so, some, some sort of that was, uh, was going on, absolutely. And the fact that they wanted to set up a center for, uh, for, for international trade as well. You know, when when in when in 1848 um, the uh, there was unrest all through the capitals of Europe. Um, uh, you know, after the not long after the publication of um, of Marx's uh, Das Kapital, this was Das Kapital. Um, they were just chugging along. There was no such unrest there, and uh, that's when they first introduced their currency. So their 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 path or, or their uh, their their, um, their 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 trajectory was different than the rest of the Europe. Of Europe's was at that time. Now, do you speak Esperanto? No, no. It's uh, I, I I've learned a little bit about it and uh, a little bit of it, but um, there's still, uh, by the way, a community in um, in Kielmis in uh, in Belgium which uh, upholds those traditions, and there's a tiny tiny museum there dedicated to the uh, to the mining community and to uh, the short-lived uh, Amicasio, uh uh, territory. Uh, that get there, ties so. in with our, our first question. Danny Chadwick asks, uh, how do the people who live in that city today feel about their current national citizen? Hi, Danny. Uh, so my understanding is that um, a lot of them don't even really know about the history of uh, either Neutral Morsnet or Amicajo. Um, and I think that they, uh, uh, I'd hate to speak for anybody there. I, Guess I should ask one of them, but uh, I think like you know, just like people who are living in uh, places that had other affiliations, you know, time marches on. But still, it's a very obscure uh, history that a lot of people don't know about, and I think that extends to people who were there. Our next question is from uh, Reagan. She asks, "What do you think we can use in this example?" Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question. So I mean. The reason why I titled uh, or I subtitled the book um, Neutral Morsnet through the revisionist lens is that most of the tellings of, um, of that story um, take it as an example of um, uh, they, they usually don't look at it uh, from the perspective of it having been stateless. They usually look at it from the perspective of it having been small or interesting, that sort of thing. But I mean, I mean, they, they, they prospered. Uh, there, there's an anecdote that says that. Um, one of the travelers to Morsnet commented that uh, that in all the other capitals of Europe there were beggars everywhere, but there wasn't a single one when they were in Kalmus. So I mean, to me, like I said, it's a vindication. I, I you know, in writing this, I thought I was I, I, I was adding um, to the to the litany of examples we have, like the American West. Or um, I wrote another article about the um, about the walled city of Kowloon, which is actually very similar, a small territory that. Thousands of people crowded into because there was a uh, sort of a uh, uh, diplomatic loophole there, which kept them from uh, having to adhere to local uh, uh, laws and, uh, and authority. So, so to me, it's just another uh, example of a of a community with with an absolute de minimis state, and the little bit of state that was there really kind of refused to rule, and um, and uh, how well they wound up. You know, there there are other things that are in the book that I didn't mention here. For example, that they really had three systems of law. They had a market for law because the law in Neutral Morsnet was construed with the old French law. You could go to Aachen, which was a nearby city, and and and, and enjoy uh, the benefits of uh, Prussian law if you had a case, or you could go to the Burgermeister, and the Burgermeister they called the Petted Tribunal because the people were arguing, he would walk up, and the two people would. Basically, say this is my side, and the other one would say this is my side, and he would give a decree right there. So, a market for justice is, um, you know, a lot of people think it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty racy concept, but they had it very easily. 
I just think it's, a, it's a great example of anarchy in action. Yeah. Our next question is from uh, Brad Moore. He asks, uh, what was the predominant current? They accepted all currencies from local nations. They, uh, they, they, I mean, I'm assuming that they were what they were before the wall, you know, the franc and the mark and all that sort of thing. But for local transactions, uh, and I think also to sort of shore up their sense of our community, there was a, a, a two franc, or a, maybe it's a, I'm not actually sure, it's a, it's a, it's a two cent uh, Moore's net piece. So they used all sorts of currencies there. Uh, Brad Moore asks, uh, is there anything written about crime rates? No, no, that's, I mean, uh, Brad, if I could uh, list 20 things I'd want to know about, that'd be one of them. Did it work? You know, how, what was the crime right there? I do know that it was a, a, a it was a smuggler's haven, that um, there was uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, brandy that was traveling uh, uh, from Morsnet into Belgium and into Germany, into Prussia. Uh, but about actual crime rates, I have no idea. That's one of the things we just don't know. Sounds like my kind of people. Uh, Reagan asks, how did you get interested in researching these uh, small little independent places? <laughs> I, I mean, uh, uh, I know that I decided to write the article on, um, on the walled city of Kowloon after I wrote this one. This was originally an article on the Mises site, and that, that was about maybe 30% as long as the book was. It's just there was so much information, I said, this has got to see the light of day. So I expanded the article into the book. But how did I originally find out about Morrison? I don't actually remember. That's an interesting question. It's probably something I was... Uh, I'm really not sure. I, I might have actually found it by... by, um, by uh, I sometimes find it interesting to look at currencies and stuff, and I might have come across come I might have come across the Morsnet currency first, which led me to this story. But I, I I don't honestly remember. I wish I did. I'd like to use that to find other things to write about in the future. Well, where did you find the bulk of your information about uh, Morsnet? I myself I I'm interested in some uh, doing some historical research, particularly mm -hmm. on some stuff in the Caribbean, and one of the things is. I sure. can't find any hard data. All I can find are, you know, uh, accounts by travelers, accounts by uh, a few people. That's most who of what's them. out there. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's most of what's out there. I mean, I found uh, newspaper articles, and I found, like I said, uh, there's the, there's a book from 1882. But even then, you know, even in that, they didn't get into, you know, people like Wilhelm Molly, who's a really important figure in, you know, Moore's Net's shift towards. Uh, Towards seeking complete and utter independence uh, right before World War One, but uh, you just uh, got to search. I mean, a lot of it was online. Some of it was in books. Uh, some of it was microfiche, that sort of thing. It was—it's a labor of love. But I mean, uh, uh, I think I've exhausted just about everything that's out there. I, I can maybe think of two anecdotes that I didn't put in the book, just because one of them was really questionable and I thought it sounded fabricated. Uh, but uh, but other than that. Pretty much everything that's out there is in the book, and it's still only 30 pages long. Now, uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about the history of Europe during that time period. Were the, mm -hmm. the uh, states around Morsnet uh, involved in uh, major struggles with each other or uh, with yeah, other states? Sure. That time yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Prussia fought a whole number of wars during that time period. Um, you know, there was, uh, like I said, there were a series of, um, of, of, uh, outbreaks of, um, of, uh, unrest, of uh, kind of left-leaning unrest and, uh, proletarian struggles, uh, in that time, and virtually none of it until World War One found its way into Morsnet. One of the things, by the way, that I wanted to mention is that, uh, is that, uh, I'd love to know more, um, uh, asked about, I was asked before about the crime rates. What I do know is that one of the things that everybody in Morsnet was interested in, and so much so that the company that owned the mine put up a big pavilion, was they were all interested in rifle marksmanship. And so when I read that, when I when I read that, and then I found out that a number of Morsnetians actually grabbed their guns and shot at advancing German troops uh, at the beginning of World War One, you know, it, it looks a lot like 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 a like civilian irregular defense. It starts to look a lot like a non-military military. You know, uh, I thought that was really interesting. I'd love to know more, but there's just not more out there. That is, that is a shame. Uh, Reagan asks, uh, "Have you visited Morsnet?" 
not yet, not yet. But I but I plan on it. In fact, the cover of the book uh, was sent to me by a by a young person who lives there. Uh, this young guy has gone around and taken pictures of all the remaining um, border markers, and so uh, he sent me one of the pictures. He sent me a bunch of pictures and said, "Choose the one you like the best," which was very kind of him. And uh, you know, I said, "I you know, I hope when I get out there, I have a chance to buy you a beer." Uh, you know, and he said, "Well, you know, come on out. It's uh, it's a great place." Brad Moore asks, "How populated is that area now?" Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. How many people live in Kelmis? I'll tell you. <laughs> Let's see. Kelmis now has a population of about 10,000. That's uh it's interesting that you know there were 5,000 what a uh, 100 years ago. And Right, but then again they were within that triangle. Right? They yeah, were within it, the it triangle is. territory, so it's grown out, I'm sure. Right. Well, uh that actually uh I'll uh, put out a last call for questions, and I'll let people know about uh, some of the stuff we've got going on here this week at Liberty Me U. Tomorrow night, we've got uh, an, another author's forum. Uh, Jason Brennan is going to be talking about his book, Why Not Capitalism? Uh, Thursday night, we've got Thaddeus Russell, who's going to be uh, giving a talk on the renegade history. and That's going to be really interesting. If you've never heard Thaddeus before, definitely come out and see that. Friday night, we've got Jason King of Sean's Outpost. He's going to be talking about outcompeting the welfare state with a special emphasis on uh, cryptocurrency. And then Roger Baer on Saturday, Bitcoin Jesus himself, will be talking about the future of Bitcoin. And then next week, we've got you know Bob Murphy's class is continuing with its second session. We're starting uh, Rick Rule's class on junior mining investment and uh, valuation. Adam Kokesh. Robert Shibley from FIRE. We've got a lot of great stuff going on uh, this week and this month and every week here at Liberty Me. So we hope to see you back. Uh, we've got uh, one more question here. Uh, Danny Chadwick asks, if it were not for the Second World War, or First World War, I guess, was there any indication of where Moorsnet may have gone in terms of national identity? There, I mean, it's... That's really hard to say. I mean, on one hand, uh, there were calls. I mentioned a few of them actually in the book. There were calls to leave Morstead alone and to give them back their sort of uh, independent identity um, uh, with a cessation of hostilities. But, um, you know, from there, the world became more statist. And it seems like, I mean, when you think about it, right now, the UN has a commission on stateless people. There's an active effort. If you don't have a state or if you're in a small group, you know, that you have to fall into one group or another. So uh, my opinion is that uh, the prospects for Morsnet staying independent were probably not that good. Then again, I mean, you look at places like um, small islands, uh, small island nations, and some of them have managed to uh, sort of do their own thing. So I think it's up in the air. I think it's easier for an island or for, uh, for uh, you know, certain indigenous communities to do than one that's in, in the middle of a number of states, especially one that's ostensibly overseen by them, and it's only 80 or 90 years in that they say, hey, are we watching these guys? What are these guys doing down there? That kind of thing. You know, as long as mine was flowing out of more, as long as zinc was flowing out of the mines, nobody seemed to really care what they were doing. It certainly uh, would have been interesting if things hadn't collapsed when they did to see what would have happened over the next uh, few decades. I mean, it... Yeah. <laughs> Knowing knowing the neighboring states, uh, it probably would have uh, collapsed at at some point. I think uh, I think the, the it was a uh, it was a very long shot that we might look on a map today and see a small you know that's another thing is that's small so small that I mean like if you were eating if you were looking at a map and you were eating a bagel one small crumb might have just blocked it out it was so small well, it's just a tiny tiny piece of land and it's in a valley on the side of a mountain so there's a lot of things that uh, lent itself. Um, that, that a lot of factors, fortuitous uh, elements that led to Morsnet becoming what it was um, and staying that way for a long time. Unfortunately, the war uh, ended everything. I, I think it'd be a really interesting research program to look into how uh, small states like uh, Liechtenstein and Andorra remained independent and to see if there are any... Like... Yeah. One of the footnotes in the book, I mentioned some that are even smaller than that. Um, there's a, uh, you know, uh, 
these the again these so-called shreds and patches of Europe are are, are way smaller than than Monaco or Liechtenstein even. I mean, Moore's Net was tiny. Um, there was an island, uh, I believe, in the Danube, which um, I have to look in my book. I, I don't remember exactly, but there was an island in the Danube that um, that uh, for the long, it was called, I think, Nobody's Island or No Man's Island, and there were a group of, I believe, Turkish descendants who lived there, and um, they lived there because they were they weren't taxable, and I think they would go from one side of the island to the other or something really clever like that. It's uh, again, it's I mean I have it right here, but I don't want to take too much time. But uh, if you look at the footnotes, you'll see an example of those sorts of things. And again, today we have micronations. Um, some of which are, 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 are you know, are, have, have distinct territories, and uh, all these small, uh, uh, all these little, little independent territories are always going to be at risk of being stomped out. You know, our hope has to be that to eventually turn the big territories into thousands of these small territories. You know, when when states uh, or when you know independent uh, territories become the size of towns and uh, and counties, I think that's when we'll see the benefits of, of, of the sort of uh, partitioning and the ability to interact voluntarily, all that sort of thing. Absolutely. Small states yeah. among big states. Or small territories among big states is a losing proposition. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight, and thank you for helping to build the tapestry of uh, anarchist political economy. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Oh, actually, we have one more question here. Uh, sure. Monica Granger asks, would you say it was the geography primarily that kept the region's political? I think it's two things. I think it was, uh, and I mentioned this also in the book, I think uh, certainly the geography helped. Also the fact that it was a mining community. Uh, mining communities are often isolated, and um, they, they even, uh, even in the Old West, mining communities, um, just like uh, wagon trains and some other example, some other examples uh, throughout history, they often organize their own local laws and rules. They have um, uh, self-defined or self-determined codes, um, which uh, heighten their level of cohesiveness, and they're 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 not having to rely on uh, on outside uh, you know authorities. So, being a mining community, especially one that's uh, that's uh, located in a really obscure valley somewhere, and one that basically, as long as what the states that were nominally overseeing it um, uh, were kept placated with, which is just zinc flying out of the ground, uh, nobody really seemed to care. Absolutely, I think uh, with you know areas such as Hong Kong, one of the uh, one of the big uh, things that has kept uh, that that region's uh, political political autonomy so uh intact is that it is kind of a a boon to the local states uh they they are getting something out of it and uh i think uh certainly in other anarchist histories we see uh, how competing interests you know the the bordering states uh yeah. nobody wanted anyone else to have it have it and so the competing interests uh, of states can sometimes keep uh keep liberty safer than it might otherwise be well thank you so much yeah. uh we just uh linked to the book in chat and it's free uh this month for liberty me members definitely check that out it looks uh fascinating and i'm looking forward to reading it and uh thanks, thanks everyone for thanks a lot thanks so much take care okay have a good night